Before we get into the episode, a quick reminder that this podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only, and nothing should be construed as investment or legal advice. If you are enjoying on-ramp media content, please like, subscribe, and share as it goes a long way in helping others find the signal through the noise. Now for a word from OnRamp, OnRamp is a Bitcoin asset management platform built on multi-institution custody. Leveraging our partnership with BitGo and their 10 plus year track record in securing assets, and CoinCover, the premier digital asset risk mitigation company, OnRamp's multi-institution custody is a segregated institutional grade vault requiring two of three institutions at any point in time to sign once a client's unique permissions have been met. At OnRamp, we understand that your Bitcoin journey is a multi-generational pursuit, catalyzed by the ideals of perseverance, aspiration, and legacy. That's why we're proud to introduce OnRamp Heritage, a suite of private client services dedicated to ensuring your Bitcoin legacy is preserved and passed on, embodying the true essence of wealth that goes beyond mere numbers. If you would like to learn more, please schedule a consultation. As we prepare for the Bitcoin halving and the next wave of global adoption of this nascent and growing asset class, we are halving all annual maintenance fees for clients that secure their wealth before the next Bitcoin epoch. What you're telling me is that music is about to stop and we're going to be left holding the biggest bag of odorous excrement ever assembled in the history of darkness. 1974. 1987, 92, 97, 2000, and whatever we want to call this. It's all just the same thing over and over. We can't help ourselves. I say when we sell. Hey, 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 hey I say when we sell. You usually have a hard stop right at, at uh, 10, 10. I do uh, 11, I think. I'm 11, yeah. 11 a.m. years. Is at 10 yeah, I got a calendar at 11. I, I got to go do something else. So, okay, I'm, so good, we, I'm good up until then, yeah. We've got an hour and 18 minutes. We're talking private equity. Larry, I completely agree with what you were just saying about private equity, having worked at a third-party uh, private equity valuations firm that, that valued mid-market private equity portfolio companies. Yeah. The, the way in which these companies are marked up, you essentially just take, you, you like back into uh, a DCF, you put an IRR on it, and then boom. That's the, yeah. that's the valuation. You call, it, you call it the value, or you... You know, you sell your twenty-five thousand dollar cat in exchange for two, or for a fifty thousand dollar dog to your friend, and he <laughs> buys some of yours, and you know that that becomes the mark. But that doesn't mean the company's really worth what the you know that marginal transaction was done at. There's just a ton of that in that industry. And I know because I was in that industry uh, from nineteen eighty, early nineteen eighties, eighty three timeframe to two thousand four, and it was bad then, and it's it's only gotten worse. You know, um, and there's. For each company, it's like, all right, let's look at this company and let's think of all the accounting tricks we can we can use to make it look sure. as valuable as possible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, and, you know, you got zombie companies, too. I mean, they, they kind of keep these things alive because they don't want to take the marks. They'd rather keep funneling money into them uh, rather than take, you know, market to market and write it off. Um, so there's there's a lot of embedded loss in, in that area, in my opinion. I mean, that. The thing I saw recently showed that there was between one and one and two trillion, close probably close to two trillion dollars worth of private equity out there, uh, which you know the, the the trade rate on that has gone down substantially. People are not buying and selling it anymore, and um, you know as a result of that, you know it's all mismarked. We we know those values aren't real. Well, yeah, I'll uh, hasten to add that as a uh, as a, an executive advisor and retired partner at Blackstone, uh, I have to plead the fifth on some of this, but nonetheless, <laughs> uh, uh, and by the way, I should mention while we're at it um, that, you know, I'm speaking in my own capacity, not in theirs, but um, uh, you may be aware that Cliff Asnes at AQR had called it liquidity laundering, uh, rightly or wrongly, but, uh, but the fact is too, and Larry, you'll know this because you were in the industry, Marty, perhaps too, that... Um, some institutional investors would prefer not to see the volatility. And, um, and oh, yeah. so, you know, they're sort of, uh, um, you know, blind to it and perhaps willfully so, but, uh, and I, I think their constituents want that too. Uh, sure. but that's just my personal opinion. I think that's right. I mean, and you know, some of it, I mean, in, in the olden days, some of it used to actually have underlying value. I mean, the structures have changed so much. I mean, when I was doing it, you know, we had preferred stock with a, 
you know, liquidation preference, sometimes redemption clauses, et cetera. And um, all we needed to do was have the company be worth more than the preferred stock or the amount we'd invested. And we knew we'd get our money back. And so we'd carry the, we'd carry the investment at cost. And that was, and that was actually a pretty conservative thing to do um, because unless the company became worth less than the capital put into it, you were fine. But of course that's all gone away. I mean, now everyone's buying common and there, you know, there are no teeth, no clauses, no nothing. And uh, you know, this is how you get these enormous markdowns. I mean, I've, we've seen some private deals in the crypto area coming around. I'm not going to say what or who that in the last round, um, you know, were valued at, uh, I think it was three, $11 billion. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the talk is that this, yeah, it's, it rhymes with the digital currency group. <laughs> <laughs> and there might be, by the way, uh, I meant to say volatility laundering, which probably makes more sense, but nonetheless, yeah. the point remains that, uh, and then, by the way, while we're talking about it, of course, sometimes there'll be a reluctance to have a down round until you'll actually postpone a capital right. raise or, or engage in other sort of uh, tricks of the trade to ensure that. Yeah, uh... and, and some of these rounds, I'm not going to say which ones, but some of these rounds are down 60, 70, 80% off the peak. You know, so it, it's, um, you know, it's, it's difficult. I mean, uh, the, the, you know, one used to value companies based on, you know, revenue and cash flow and, you know, book value and so on and so forth. And, and those are still useful metrics to old school financial people. But, um, you know, as, as we saw in the dot com area, it was based on eyeballs and we're seeing a little bit of the same thing this time around. There, there are different metrics that people are using to value these things. And, they're, you know, they're pretty aggressive. The, the funny thing is, well, we'd like to say uh, hopefully this time is different. Uh, we have like meme to i don't even know i just hear it in the background there's just like things that are just consistently like trying to like hit ddos your brain and so you're just like trying to you know stiff arm them and this like meme token just keeps like meme tokens keep going you see them on twitter the dashboard of all the people's different like meme meme tokens uh and this idea that we're still you know before the halving we hit this price and we got like meme tokens taken off like god knows what's going to happen the next 12 oh, to 24 yeah. months from evaluation and craziness yeah there's always there's always silly stuff being done i mean i you know it's it's amazing to me, but it, it, we keep making the same mistakes over and over again in finance. Or some people do, yeah. I should say. And, and it, it really just kind of goes back to that all assets have become store of value buckets. Uh, you know, equities yeah. in particular. We we e equities in real estate we've started to treat as our savings. Yeah. And you know, you don't expect volatility. You don't expect down rounds when it's a, a savings mentality about an asset class. And, uh, you know, I think Larry, before we started, you, you talked about how there's going to be a, have to be a hell of a repricing for equities, um, you know, when they convert to a Bitcoin standard eventually over time. And, you know, what matters then is your sat flow, bringing right. it back to the actual value investing principles of what matters is cash flow. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that, that changing philosophy is going to be quite, um, quite something to live through. And, you know, we're at the very beginning of it with MicroStrategy. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, the everything will be repriced. And, and, and I think the price of everything in the world today is wrong. I mean, it, it's, um, you know, that, and, but that we, that's what you would expect. I mean, if you, if you take fiat money and, you know, you hold interest rates at zero for long periods of time and you distort things as badly as we've distorted them, um, you know, you're going to get, you know, outrageous effects and you're going to get, you know, I mean, you're going to get the we works of the world or you're going to get, you know, all the, all the silly shit that happened, um, you know, the FTXs, et cetera. And, uh, you know, they, they, they need to get cleansed out and they will, but it's, we're not done. Um, you know, I, I think you can go on coin market cap and you can see, you know, Dogecoin is still a you know multi-billion dollar asset. It makes no sense to me, but there it is, you know? <laughs> And there, there are a lot of other things in the, in the, you know, in the private equity world that have similar characteristics. Well, in addition to monkeying around with the cost of capital from the producer's perspective, from the consumer's perspective, people are kind of forced along and perhaps this goes without saying the risk curve. And so they're, they're going into riskier investments um, and perhaps unnecessarily so, right? I mean, because if we had a, uh, an interest rate, a cost of money that was um, arrived at naturally, then they wouldn't be forced to engage in, in risky behavior if you can earn 10% of your cash. Um, 
in the fiat world, then no need to go into, you know, junk bonds or whatever might happen to be just to earn a yield. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. That's a really great point that, that, you know, the way the system has been set up, we've all been forced to become kind of casino gamblers because, you know, the holding a dollar or holding a bond is, is a hot potato, right? We, we know that, you know, year after year, relentlessly, it's losing value. It varies any given year how much it's going to lose, but it's definitely going to lose value every year. And so you've got to figure out where you're going to go to try and protect your purchasing power. And, you know, there are a lot of arguments for lots of different areas. I mean, uh, you know, you make arguments for real estate, but you can't move it and it's taxable. Um, you know, Saylor makes an argument for, you know, kind of the, the, the equities of what he calls digital monopolies, which, you know, are Google and Facebook and, you know, and, you know and Amazon and so forth. Um, and, and I think there's an argument for that. I think they've protected you against debasement, but, um, you know, they're not, those things aren't cheap, uh, on, on value metrics for sure. So, uh, but it, you know, it's, it's tough. I mean, everybody, I mean, that's, to me, that's the great tragedy of fiat of the fiat system is that nobody can really afford to retire because nobody really knows that they have enough money because the money is always losing value. And, um, and, and that's a, that's just a crime and it's sad. It's very sad. I mean, you can. You think you're rich, but but in reality, you're not necessarily rich because if the price level, you know, quadruples, you know, what you have won't buy anything. So it's and you're you're constantly fighting that battle, and and you get taxed on it too. I mean, you you, you know, you go and you do it. You, you buy an asset to try and fight that battle, but then, you know, just it's just protecting your loss and purchasing power. And yet, when you go to sell it for a gain, you've got to pay a tax on the gain. Right. I, yeah. I've been recently fascinated with um, the the fire movement, the um, <laughs> financial independence, retire early people and, the, and their whole like they're, they're basing their entire life on the assumption that if you can get enough of a net worth that you're only spending 4% of it per year, that's your safe withdrawal rate, that right. you're going to be fine. And that just totally ignores the possibility of, of inflation and debasement of that uh, net worth uh, such that, you know, $10 million today doesn't buy you $10 million worth of, of goods 20 years from now. And, right. and I, you know, I have a feeling that there's going to be quite a few people who are retired now who, who have to, uh, you, you know, tighten the belt or um, go back to work over the next couple of decades. I think this is right. completely, completely different, or I don't even know if we want to go down this road, but I think like the fire thing, because I've seen it on the cursory feels <laughs> like a very like fiat driven uh, thing in general. <laughs> Like that people just generally don't like their work or what they do. So they want to retire early to, to do what? And I know he gets a lot of slack, but, you know, um, 20, whatever, 15, 18, Jordan Peterson, I think had a lot of very great things that he said. And one of them was like, so you retire and then you, you sit on it. So you, so you're good. And then you go sit on the beach and you drink five pina coladas or whatever, two pina coladas, and then you pass out and you're sunburned and then you wake up the next day and it's like, well, then what do you do? It's like, there's a lot more to life than, than retiring. It's like, well, what is that? I don't know. But I think like when you have meaning and all the things that we're talking about with money start to come back to the world, you're not necessarily worried about retiring. You're more worried about how do you like take the gifts that you were given and get them back out into the world versus retiring and then sitting around. And the fire movements pretty funny because it's an outgrowth of inf influencer culture it's basically a bunch of 25 to 30 year olds saying I'm gonna teach teach my yeah uh, fellow gen z and millennials how to retire early it's like eh, i don't know if you have it figured out yet but like on the no. same point too like we're talking about retirement that's a newsletter i wrote a couple of days ago uh just I randomly stumbled upon the state of state pensions yeah. a couple of days ago as of September end of Q3 2022. And at that point, uh, state pensions across the U.S. were, they, they have a gap of $1.2 trillion, and that's only state wow. pensions. We're wow. not even talking about unfunded liabilities in terms of Medicaid, Social Security, private company pensions. And you think about the Herculean effort that's going to be needed to close that gap, and there's very few things that can do that and basically the conclude and the conclusion i came to is you look at the demographics all the boomers are retiring um a lot of the those pension plans have shifted to an 80 20 portfolio stock bond split um towards the end of those life cycles for for those individuals and tlt's down 25 percent over the last five years they're gonna have to sell all those assets and 
as you were mentioning, the only way you're going to be able to fill this gap is to print money and backstop it, which right. is essentially yeah. default in another way. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, the bottom line is we are heading for a monetary default. You know, the, the system is completely broken. And, you know, as, as you say, Marty, you know, fix the money, fix the world. I mean, the money's broken. And it's going it, to, if you think it's broken now, just wait. It's going to get worse, sadly. Uh, and, uh, you know, everyone will get paid in nominal terms, but what's it going to buy you? You know, I think the answer is not much uh, unless you're protecting yourself with investments and assets that, that you know, address this issue. Right? Well, what's even worse, uh, mentioning or referencing what you mentioned earlier, uh, Larry, um, is that, yeah, you get, cap you get um, taxed on the capital gains once you're monetizing your investments. And of course, if you get taxed a couple of times if you're uh, receiving dividends. But the other thing too, is that as you know, as everyone on this call knows, uh, there's a movement afoot now that tax unrealized gains. I saw <laughs> that. I mean, I, Elizabeth Warren <laughs> wants to go after wealthy people. And, and of course, you know, what's wealthy will get defined downward. I mean, it's, it's, it, you know, you guys probably know this. And, you know, when the income tax came out in 1913, I mean, it was meant for just like the very, very wealthiest people, right? And of course, you know, that quickly changed. And, and, and it yeah, was that's, like 4%. It's, it's, a very, it's a very slippery slope, right? I mean, it, um, if they're able to get that through, um, you know, look out, nothing's going to be safe. Um, you know, so. That's right. Yeah. Better figure yeah. out how to remember 12 words in your head. It's the only way you well, can save your money. Right. I think that I think that really we all know what the solution is to this problem. And, uh, you know, the, the thing, the reason we're all doing this, I think, is because we're trying to educate the rest of the world to protect themselves because it's going to be you know, very difficult for those who don't learn this, um, you know, rather sadly. I, I think the, the positive, ideally, the positive here is just the game theory around attracting capital and talent that we're seeing. We know these regions are trying to attract via yeah. ETF. But then also we've seen what's happening in the UAE. We've seen Florida, Texas, like other places. Ideally, we don't have to leave the United States to make this work. And there's enough um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, no, I think I, I very much believe that, that the U.S. is worth saving and, and will be saved. And we will save it. But, um, you know, it, it's also going to there's going to be a lot of tumult in this whole thing, for sure. Sadly. There is. But on a positive note, we were discussing before we hit record record ron paul was on tucker carlson earlier this week and i think a lot of what he started back in his 2008 presidential campaign the <laughs> seeds of that campaign and the ideas he planted in the minds of many young people myself included are beginning to um to birth flowers in in the movement Absolutely. of liberty in terms of people really waking up to these systemic problems it's a combination of the ideas that he put forth over 15 years ago and the fact that more and more individuals are confronted with the reality of inflation and it's an effect on their everyday life. And so That's while things true. are insane, and I, I do have confidence that people are waking up. Obviously we have this show. I've got a couple other shows. We're all doing what we're doing for very specific reasons. I think yeah. we're beginning to pick up the ball and basically lead people to to the light, yeah. if you will. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's, a, there's gonna, and there's going to be a tipping point here. I mean, it's, you know, all the country, the entire country knows we've got an inflation problem. You know, the other side has managed to think, get the country to think that they're going to solve it. But that's going to be, it's going to become obvious, I think, in the next year or two, that they can't solve it. And then it's really going to get interesting, right? <laughs> well, I think so. well, yesterday I could be on a uh, different podcast. Um, you know, it used to be that uh, libertarian nerds like us uh, were the only ones who ever talked about Austrian economics. Right. And now it's like re really gaining currency, certainly right. within the Bitcoin movement, but uh, but elsewhere as well. I mean, this used to be sort of rarefied air. And Absolutely. now everybody seems to be breathing it in. Yeah, no, it's, it's I mean, that's Saifedean's book. And yeah, I mean, I've said many times, it's really great. It was great for me when your generation showed up. You know, it's like the reinforcements arrived, right? I mean, it's, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's, I, I got I got twenty year olds talking to me about von Mises, and I mean, and, and you know, and telling me I'm an old fashioned guy because I like gold. And I'm like, you know, look, dude, you know, I was into hard money before you were born. <laughs> 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 don't, don't, don't lecture my ass, all right? 
<laughs> That's a good T-shirt there, Larry. Yeah, right. <laughs> you wear that at the next uh, Bitcoin I mean, conference. That really is true in some of these cases, right? I mean, that that's really a a great point from like independent of Bitcoin. I think there's a return to first principles thinking. It's a it's a random thing to bring up, but the seed oil deal. Like people in Bitcoin were talking about like seed oil for, for years, and we're seeing this like back to cleaner eating. But this goes to like medical treatments, and we don't have to get you know too political. But there's a resurgence of like how do we actually think about what did thing how were things done forever. And then where did we like insert where things started to maybe not make sense? And let's actually like go back to first principles. And I think the money is just one part of that. Um, oh, yeah. No, we live in the yeah, yeah, world. I mean, look at look at healthcare and the diet. You know, look at the way that that guy at Harvard was able to convince everybody that, you know, that, that fat was bad for you, right? That, that <laughs> butter was bad for you and that beef was bad for it had fat in it. We should all be eating carbohydrates and sugar. I mean, you know, that did more damage. Societal cost. Yeah, that did more damage to the overall health of the United States population than, than anything, you know, anything. That I think in the last fifty years. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, we've got we've got fiat medicine, we've got fiat food, we've got you know, fiat jobs. The whole damn thing is just a complete, you know, it's just it's built on on you know mistruths in a lot of cases. That mistruths that serve to somebody you know, to, to make a profit. I mean, um, you know, that guy was paid by General Mills, right? And, and other big food companies. So, um, you know, it's, it's, you see it everywhere. Qui bono, right? And yeah, um, exactly. the, uh, but, you know, once, once you develop the critical thinking skills to, to get to the origins of money, you, you can see it in the Bitcoin movement. I mean, you know, that's why I think so many people tend to be, enlightened when it comes to their diet. And as you said, I think it was Marty or maybe it was Jesse, um, you know, getting back to first principles when it comes to um, to medicine and uh, across the board, it's really interesting to me that independently, it seems like we're all arriving at the same conclusions. Yeah, well, that's right. I mean, it, and, you know, I mean, first principles on government, right? I mean, it's, you know, like everybody used to trust the government. I've seen surveys now that 80% of the people do not trust the government. Probably the other 20% are employed by the government. <laughs> so you know, they're a little biased in their view, right? I mean, it, uh, and you know, I mean, it's like it's fascinating to me, for example, to watch the way the Overton window has shifted on the murder of Kennedy, right? I mean, I knew twenty years ago that the CIA killed Kennedy. There's no fucking doubt in my mind. I mean, it's it's indisputable beyond, you know, I mean, the, the proof is just so obvious, it's ridiculous. And yet, you know, I used to say that to people, and they thought I would, you know, I had three heads, or I was a conspiracy theorist, as a nut job, you know, whatever. And now, you know, I mean, just yesterday, you know, Jack Dorsey was tweeting about it. I mean, you know, you've got billionaires and, and you know, I mean, this, you ask my kids, you ask people their generation, you know, who killed Kennedy? Oh, the CIA did. Everybody knows that. Um, and, and so, you know, what you're beginning to see is this whole facade that this, you know, this fiat government built up of how we should trust them and how powerful they are and how great they are. It's crumbling. And uh what? You know, it's very, very much the way, you know, I, I look at the way, you know, Russia was before Russia fell. You know, I mean, they, they, you know, it got to the point where everybody knew they were lying to you about everything. And that's kind of where we're going, I think, in the United States. And as a result of that, I mean, we, we haven't figured out the mechanisms to fix it yet. You know, we, the voting doesn't seem to work because they rigged the elections and, you know, a lot of issues. But, but, but the point is, we're, we're, we're you know, slowly but surely the pieces are getting put into place to dismantle that broken system you know i mean you've got tucker carlson's you've got joe rogan's you've got you know networks that aren't being listened to etc so um you know it's it's all it's all of the same thing which i think is a trend towards decentralization and you know and, and a trend towards critical thinking um which is not to say that all of our fellow citizens get it you know many of them do not but um, but more and more waking up all the time. And that's, that's a good thing. And, and by the way, when the, when the, you know, the pain of inflation gets to the point where it's unbearable, which I think it's going to, is going to happen in the next cycle here. Um, you know, you're going to find more and more people asking how the hell did this happen? What's going on? Why is this broken and demanding that we change, um, you know, the, the system we've got, and that'll be a very good thing. And it's all accelerating, um, whether it's yeah. monetarily, socially, from a exactly. healthcare perspective, like you look at what's happening with the squatters in New York right. or San Francisco right. or Portland, wherever it may be. I mean, that was a big story this week, particularly in New York. A woman in Staten Island um, went to 
um, basically kicked squatters out of her house and got arrested for doing that. And not only are the powers that be not respecting um, the uh, purchasing power of individuals by preserving the monetary system, they're completely abusing it. They're now leaking into social issues, whether it be property rights or right. the, the whole conversation around illegal immigration. And then on top of that, they're really attacking the productive class of so the government being the unproductive class, really right. trying to browbeat the productive class. And that's why you see the Jack Dorsey's, the Elon Musk of the world really beginning to retaliate and say, Hey, you, you people are systemically breaking this country that we, that we've been building over the last 250 years. Like, well, I'm starting right. to ring the alarm bells, and you see brave, specific groups taking action. I mean, I, you know, the truckers in, mm. in Canada is an example, etc. I mean, you know, people will only put up with so much, and um, you know, and I and I think people know who's doing it to them, and it's becoming they're becoming increasingly aware of who's doing it to them, and so, um, you know. The, the 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 other side of our trade is playing a losing hand, uh, just no doubt. Um, and our job is to try and make that you know make them lose faster, because we all have limited lifespans, and we want our kids to live in a better world. So, well, um, on that right. point, like as fast as possible, because it has become abundantly clear to me that we're in the looting the treasury phase of late stage right. empire, where they're literally just stealing. Yeah. And yeah. trying to make everybody yeah. believe, no, we need to do this, we need to do this. And they're literally stealing it out of everybody's pocket as they're yep. holding them at bay. Yep. Um, literally stealing property, stealing purchasing power, stealing lifespan in terms right. of pushing this bad healthcare yep. system, and this bad food system on people, and then pushing drugs on people as well. Um, I think there's a moral imperative, and that's something that um, Dr. Paul talked about with – Tucker Carlson think there's a moral imperative to speak out aggressively um, against this because they're literally looting the treasury right now, stealing people's. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it, it goes to, it goes to so many different areas. I mean, you know, the, you know, the, the fiat money funds the wars, right? I mean, without fiat money, we wouldn't have blown $6 trillion in, you know, in useless stuff in the Middle East, you know, trying to gain control of oil. I mean, you know, without fiat money, we'd probably have a, a, a big, you know, an intelligent, you know, nuclear power program because it's the most efficient, you know, power generation source ever invented. And, you know, notice that China is going crazy and, and building a ton of nuclear reactors. And, of course, we're not building or decommissioning nuclear reactors. So um, I, I found it interesting, though. I, I thought my sailor was so brilliant. And I, I listened to him when I was in Madeira and he made the statement that, uh, you know, don't worry about nuclear. It's going to come because what's going to happen is AI, the amount of power that AI consumes is so large compared to, you know, even Bitcoin mining or just general, you know, compute power that, that the only way we're able, we're going to be able to move AI forward is with nuclear power. And therefore what's going to happen is, you know, the Apples, the NVIDIAs and, and the big corporations that are pushing AI are going to demand nuclear because there's just no way to do it without nuclear. So I thought, no, oh, that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, maybe we don't have to work at it on the grassroots level. It's just going to come from the top down to these people are going to demand it. And it is so obvious that we need it. I mean, in, in terms of, you know, the return on energy invested is just, it's so far ahead of everything else. It's, it's, it's as to be ridiculous, right? Um, well, getting back also to a point you just made, Larry, um, I think it's the, the fiat funding of wars that really gets under my skin more so than even some other things, because here we are sort of underwriting the murder of other people. And if instead we went door to door to each taxpayer's house and said, Hey, would you contribute $10,000 to this war in the Middle East? Nobody would say yes, Correct. but because we can print the money, we do it instead. And we kill a bunch of Americans, not to mention countless others for these wars that accomplish virtually nothing in my opinion. No, I think Make things actually, worse actually. Yeah, it's absolutely right. Right. The world. yeah, it's absolutely right. I mean, we need to really reimagine government as a much smaller entity, you know, the way it was envisioned by the founding fathers, you know, um, I mean, the way I envision government, I think government ought to be a referee. I mean, we need, in my opinion, we need a government to, um, you know, put criminals in jail and have a court system and enforce the rule of law. Other than that, I don't think as much government needs to do, I, you know, the whole, the whole, um, you know, um, Social Security, all, all the other stuff they do, I think, is, is a boondoggle and would be better done privately. 
Um, but, you know, I mean, sadly, we're just a long ways away from that kind of a world. Um, and it's going to take, you know, failure of big government on a spectacular scale, which I think is coming um, to get to get to the world that, you know, that I envision. Um, you know, but yeah, I, I, you know, I think if you look at, I mean, there are bad actors in the world and there are criminals in the world, but I think in general, you know, it, it stay at a state level that, the, you know, that, um, there don't need to be criminals. I mean, it was, you know, um, World War II allowed, you know, criminals to get a hold of big, powerful states, you know, most notably, you know, Hitler and Germany. And, um, but I, I, I don't think, you know, we need, we don't need these big, powerful states anymore. We can have a much more decentralized world. And, you know, the average healthy human being doesn't want to kill other human beings. It doesn't, you know, I don't have any an animus against, you know, people in Iraq or China or Russia or anywhere else. I mean, they're, they're people just like we are. And uh, most of them just want to, you know, live their lives and raise their families. Um, you know, and they're within that group. They're obviously criminals. Um, criminals need to be prosecuted. And that's why government should exist. But to me, that's about it. Right? Yeah, this is yeah. where... Uh... The, the, the one area where I feel like I, I never, the, the Ron Paul stuff never made sense to me or Occupy Wall Street never made sense to me because the, the assumption in there, Larry, is that <clears throat> that we can um, self-impose austerity or, or, you know, cut the fat, trim back uh, right. through, through conscious, deliberate um, reevaluation of what makes sense in government spending and, and what doesn't. And then and that uh, special interests won't um, prevail in that uh, debate. And, right. and I've always ha ha, you know, had no faith in that and um, believed that it was a lost cause as a result until Bitcoin, until this sort of sly roundabout way of reimposing um, sanity, uh, fiscal sanity and, and austerity uh, in a time when there's too much, when there's excess, it, Bitcoin doesn't allow for excess. So it imposes right. austerity because it aligns with the interests of, of all levels, um, whether that's, you know, the most powerful industries in the world or the individuals, people and companies and governments are going to want Bitcoin and are going to choose Bitcoin over uh, the excesses, the unsustainable excesses of, of fiat. And that that's the only way that that um, rational yeah, I mean, sanity is restored. I would agree. I mean, it's a level playing field and that's, you know, that's, the, that's the big difference, right? I mean, you know, the contillionaires now, you know, they get to borrow at low rates and, you know, let me borrow at low rates and invest at 10% and I'll be rich too. Um, and that's, that's really the system that we've got today is set up to benefit a small group of people. And, uh, that's just got to change. Um, but and I mean, I, you know, I think it will. And I'm I'm currently reading Murray Rothbard's A History of Banking and Money, Money yeah. and Banking in the United States, and it's really it makes me very optimistic about where we are now. Because if you go and read what the colonies had to do to erect their own monetary systems, it was completely convoluted in the sense that they need to get physical specie within the borders of the colonies, typically the Spanish silver dollar uh, right. and and some gold. But like the physical nature of that um, made it very hard, and, and I think the opportunity that we have today to really fix this system, because again, the, the system's broken at the core because money is the most important tool, and we've broken the money, and that's something that makes me extremely optimistic. Anchoring back to what the colonies went through when they were trying to figure out money is that it was hard because they were living in this physical world. And now we do have these massive problems as a global society, but we have this digital open permissionless network that anybody can plug into and it makes solving right. that problem of money much easier on a global scale. Um, totally it's, agree. It's, I mean, it's, we've got the perfect tool, you know, it's, it's just, it's absolutely the perfect tool. And, you know, it's clear as day to me that, you know, everything will be priced in sats at some point, you know, that, that it's a better form of money and therefore it will be the base layer of everything. And, you know, people will look back on this whole central bank era. I, I saw there was a great tweet the other day. Somebody called it like it would be like bloodletting. I think it was Alex Leishman from River said. That's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to we're going to look back at central banking and compare it to, you know, bloodletting of, of the doctors of the you know the Middle Ages. And uh, I think that's right. I mean, you can't you know, how can a how can a committee of bureaucrats, unelected bureaucrats set the most important price in the world, which is the price of time, and the price of money? They, they can't. Well, let, let's go a little. 
a little further on that though, because it's actually relevant and it was shared on the Ethereum and the ETF and this thing happening right now with BlackRock and the other institutions. And then you mentioned small consortium. You have the ETH Foundation. Like I think of them as the same thing as the dollar, right? You have people right. messing with the monetary policy. But this direct path is obviously not a direct line. And you've talked about this a lot, Larry, and you know, your history and what happened around the GFC and how the games and the rules were shifted. And there's right. been this conversation around BlackRock and you know, good actor, bad actor, what, what do they mean? But this notion of permissionless money going into a centralized entity um, is obviously an issue. But then also this idea that we're going to like tokenize a bunch of other assets. And also, you know, that's a, that's what my mind on ETF is a tokenization, a, a tokenized yeah. asset on Bitcoin. But then right. you have an ETH ETF and that opens up that aperture into digital assets. Like there's something there um, that we've talked about for the past year that doesn't doesn't feel or seem right as far as uh, the, tr the direction we want this to go. And curious if you guys think about it um, in a similar light or if you have any kind of thoughts on it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't think about ETH too much. I mean, I, you know, and I, and I, think, I, I think BlackRock getting into like ETH and like what do they position to institutional investors and how is that like the thought of that asset and that's your proxy for how you get into digital assets is via, the, via these ETFs. Um, yeah. I mean, ETH doesn't pass the Howey test, right? I mean, ETH is a security and, um, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know how they're going to let it be, you know, whether they're going to approve an ETF or not. I don't really follow that. I mean, I try to be somewhat charitable and accept that there are shit coins like ETH and all the others that actually may be doing something technologically that is, you know, worthwhile. Um, but because they're flawed at the fundamental premise level of not being proof of work, um, I think that whatever they're doing should be built on top of Bitcoin because you've got to start with a sound base layer. So, um, you know, I've, I've had a lot of people kind of attack me for being a maxi and, and hating shit coiners. And, you know, I think it's, <coughs> excuse me, I think it's fair to hate shit coiners in general because a lot of them are just in it for the grift. But to be fair to them, there are some people in the digital asset space that are trying to actually tokenize and build applications that will have value. And, um, you know, I'm not opposed to building things that will have value. I just think that building them on coins other than uh, Bitcoin is, is a fool's errand because the monetary policy of those coins is flawed, you know. So I don't know. That's kind of how I see shitcoin land. Well, there's a general... Um... There's a general principle with, with which I think we're all well acquainted, which is, you know, decentralization is the answer. And right. Larry referenced it early when it comes to political economy, but it's true just in general. So that this open source nature of Bitcoin, I think, is the secret sauce. Right. Anything that's centralized, I know that we all know this, but anything that centralizes is inherently flawed. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the whole point of also the, we talked about the information and all the things that are, kind of co-opted how we think Jesse before the pod was referencing um, the Ron Paul stuff and, and the, the news and the media back then and how vilified and all the things, the connotations that were given to him and the, the, the incentive model of Bitcoin has people adopting it. But I think that there's a natural thing of the internet and a lot of these concepts to your point, David is the most decentralized form of information um, delivery mechanism we've ever seen. And so you get to like, it was almost inevitable in my mind, independent of Bitcoin, that a lot of these concepts were going to come out because they were just fundamentally true, but we only had centralized versions of how it was given to us, whether it was via, you know, certain books or, you know, three news channels or whatever existed for the past, you know, pre-internet. Um, so a lot of this stuff ties directly into your point, decentralization and getting the information out and in the, to the broadest way with the most number of people. I think Marty's, uh, you know, TFTC is a great example of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think in the when the history of this era is written, the two biggest developments I'm not sure which is bigger or in, in you know order will be, but will be the inter the development of the internet and the development of Bitcoin, um, because the internet basically decentralized information communications. I mean, anyone can be the New York Times now. You can get on the internet and have your own pod. You know, look at Marty, and and you can exceed and, and do better quality work than you know big networks, right? And then. And anyone can communicate with anyone. It's all decentralized. And then, of course, Bitcoin is just the, the monetary version of that. So uh, I think when it's all said and done, you know, people are going to look back and say that was the beginning of, of, you know, what fixed the world. I mean, we reached peak centralization in World War II. You know, we killed 50 million people in seven years or something. And, uh, 
and it showed the dangers of centralization because you get a big powerful country like germany you get an idiot running it and you know you go and murder six million jews i mean that you know centralization is dangerous inherently as long as evil people exist and evil people will always exist so uh decentralization addresses it right because it's often, uh, the people sorry marty but it's often the very people who seek high office who uh <laughs> you don't necessarily want in office and hitler sort of the the the, the oh it's, the, yeah, it's the, almost, like almost a perfect correlation between the people who want these jobs and the people we don't want in them i mean i've often said we'd be better off picking our elected representatives out of the phone book i mean yeah, i would, didn't I would uh, trust, Buckley say that yeah i would trust my stupid neighbors over the people we elect i mean <laughs> they're, they're stupid but they're, they're not evil do you know what i mean i mean they're, they're good-hearted they're just not very Fair. bright in cases <laughs> Yeah, sometimes I don't know, Larry, just have, need... you, have you ever have you ever been to an HOA meeting? I, I'm not so sure about that. Oh, that's it's uh, the sociopath yeah, oh, yeah, on a micro yeah, scale. Yeah, pl plenty of them, and, and yeah, I know what you're talking about, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, and it's cra uh, Going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole it really highlights that centralization is not only a problem of money; it's a problem everywhere else. It's like a big point in our lives. My wife and I is really on the food side. We were talking about that earlier. And she, my wife has gone full down the rabbit hole of making sure we're eating as cleanly as possible. And one of the ways in which we do that is we go to um, basically a farm stand around the corner called Local Pastures. And they have a bunch of beef and milk and cheese from local farms all around the Austin area. And it highlights that like this distributed nature of food delivery is much better. Like the food that we eat is insanely more healthy, tastes better. Um, it's a little bit more expensive, but it's worth it. But going back to the main point of centralization, like you can't have the Federal Reserve Board run um, a monetary system. You can't have four major slaughterhouses run a food system in the healthcare system. You can't have three major pharma companies run uh, the solutions for um, for medical ailments. And uh, it's crazy. At peak centralization, Larry, you said, World War Two, like I would argue, like maybe in the last two decades, we'll look back and say, like this was peak peak centralization, um, outside of force and money, it sort of uh, metastasized into every point of our life, whether it be food, healthcare, the university yeah, system. Right. Yeah, and, you might uh, be right. It, 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 the, but, fiat, the fiat world really got you know very centralized in the last. Yeah, you, know, I, you gotta be careful. You know, the that it was I can't help but on it. top on fiat world because it just gets it keeps getting worse. Yeah, that's true. I, I feel like it. You know, once once the USSR was no longer keeping us honest uh, in terms of like like you know, like high school fitness. Um, you know, back when the USSR was a threat, was was taken seriously. Like we were cultivating fighting ready men uh, and making sure that that was part of what we were doing in high school. And, you know, that comes with like a, a hardness and, you know, like tough life principles and values being instilled in our younger generations. And then, you know, that threat goes out the window and everybody relaxes, kicks their feet up and opens a bag of potato chips. And, and you know, 30 years later, it's not looking so good. It, it's, a, <laughs> it's a great point because generally somebody would say like, how do you get from those two? But they're direct in the same way. No, generally people haven't been worried about the border. They're like, let people in, but then they don't care about the border of their, your own house anymore. What, what Marta is referencing on the squatter. And that's like 12 months, right? You're like incepting in this idea that borders don't matter. And it's like, well, of course, if, if, you're like, it's okay over there because it's not in my city or state. But now they're in your home and you're like, how do we get here? And to Jesse's point, it's like we like took away like fitness and health. And now it's like, well, no, you send somebody off or you're trying to, you know, build a, a society that is strong. And you're like, how, how do we get here? It's like, well, you started over here. Well, it's a slippery slope. I mean, if property rights don't matter in California. You can go into any store and steal less than a thousand dollars and they won't even prosecute you. They don't have time. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very, very slippery slope once you decide that the standards are, are loosey goosey, right? It's, it, this is an interesting theme. Um, I heard something today, Jesse, or this week that was like really transformative and just like how I think about what we're doing here is um, there's a guy that's joining us that became a client. Great guy, holds his keys, probably majority holds his keys and we're in a marketing meeting. He says, I, I like OnRamp because it's a version of, uh, I want to believe in a world where we still trust institutions. And I, and it hit me very hard simply because I started to think, and I'd be curious because I know this is going to be like polarizing thought, but this version of 
if we all hold our keys and don't trust anybody that inherently, whether it's explicitly known or not is baking in that we can't actually trust anybody. <laughs> and like, that's not like, I think it's almost like, seems like a, I don't know if cognitive distance is the right word, but like, and to, it's the opposite of building a more prosperous world because in reality, just like from coordinating economic activity, like you have to work with other people and you have to like cooperate. Um, but I think this ties into what we're talking about here is like, we want to build a better world. We have to like, think about it in that way. And like some of these ideas around. Yeah. I, know, I think, I think you've, you, you're always going to have to trust people. I mean, I have to trust that the farmer is not giving me bad food. That's going to kill me. And, and, and reputation is always going to matter. And I, I like Reagan's line towards the Soviet Union back in the eighties where he's, you know, he said, trust, but verify. Right. And I think that's, I think that's really where Bitcoiners are. I mean, it, it you know, we can trust, I mean, it, you, you know, you're not going to trust Sam Bankman fried. I mean, we all knew he was a bad guy from day one, but um, you know, he certainly, there are, or, I mean, trust and reputation are built up over time. And, um, and that's a good thing. And, and that's absolutely essential to a functioning society. I mean, you can't, you know, I don't want to have to test my food every time before I eat it to make sure the food producer hasn't poisoned me. I mean, I, you know, that, that's ridiculous. I've got to buy it from people I trust. Right? Yeah, and that's that's one of the bad memes that's permeated in some Bitcoin circles is this idea of trustlessness, which is not the case. It's you, Bitcoin provides us with a way to have a trust-minimized money system where you can always fall back to holding and securing your own private keys Um uh, yourself and minimize the trust you need. But in that relationship, you still need trust and you need trust that you're going to be able to competently access and, and utilize your, your private keys. And so like it works on a scale from there. I think that's the beauty of Bitcoin is that you can always fall back to that extreme trust minimized position. But from there you do want to build trust. And I think that creates an incentive system where as you're operating throughout the account economy, your counterparties always understand you have that trust minimized fallback option of falling back to holding your own private keys. And so they're incentivized to provide a good service and gain your trust in that economic interaction. And it's like the small details of that trust minimized base that we're all working from that can really build a flourishing economy imbued with a lot of trust between individual actors in that economy. Well, it's, it's, and, and I was just saying, and a decentralized world with instant communication, you know, a breach of trust is like instantly, you know, broadcast, right? I mean, so that the, a bad actor can't live for long, right? I mean, that's, and that's a good thing. Right? And, and Marty, that, that's such a profound way you put it, because that's like what was baked in. And, and I think some of the stuff was known, but the first trust we did was the idea that like, a, you shouldn't have a centralized custodian holding the keys, but then B, the mechanism to be able to take delivery is very important because the underlying properties of that are what give Bitcoin value. And, and this at the time was pre-ETF and now we're post-ETF and we still have the same problem around, you know, whatever came out this week, it's like 90% of all the ETF assets that with Coinbase. But then the notion that you also can't have that point to you, which you drove on, it's like keeping people honest and knowing that your Bitcoin's there. Um, which I think that's where like we feel confident and I think everyone on this podcast think if we're gonna be successful in all of this, the right things need to be built because the way they're being built today are, don't feel like sustainable if um, this thing actually is successful. Yeah, M Marty and, and, and Michael there nailed this. Bitcoin creates this, this shift in the landscape of trust that Marty beautifully said how it, it pairs it back to like, you can fall back to trust a trust minimized um, stance, but then we have to build from there. We have to build the sort of economy, uh, the industry, the the landscape that we want to see that that works for how humans are set up. Um, you know, we're set up to r place trust in um, individuals and entities that have earned trust and have a good reputation um, in order to do things that would be hard for us to do ourselves, whether that's growing your own food or, you know, um, financial services that are built on Bitcoin, where you're trusting the company to do something that, that you could do yourself. It would be very, very hard to do. And, you know, that's the, the ethos that OnRamp has been built with is, um, you know, versus an ETF where it's cash creates and redeems. So for everyone listening, if you have a friend or 
or, or family member who's thinking about getting a Bitcoin position and they're just going to buy the ETF, they should know that currently it is cash create and cash redeem. So if they want to ever take control of their Bitcoin, if they ever want to graduate to self-custody, um, they have a taxable event when they sell their coin, their, their ETF position, and then use those proceeds to buy real Bitcoin. Um, that's a taxable event because they're not allowed to withdraw Bitcoin from an ETF as it, as it currently stands. Um, but the on-ramp Bitcoin trust, we set up with that specific first principle in mind that people should be able to withdraw their Bitcoin without a taxable event. Uh, that should be a part of how any of these uh, vehicles operate. And so we made it that way. So, you know, let your friends and, and, and family know that if they're thinking about taking a position um, in an ETF, that maybe they should talk to, to OnRamp uh, instead and see if that's a better fit, especially with our, our, our approach to custody with a multi-institution custody where we're not giving our coins to Coinbase. Um, we are holding those coins in a multi-sig fashion where three institutions each hold one key and none have unilateral control over the assets. Uh, and so that those are the two big differences versus the ETFs that, you know, we designed um, this vehicle the way it should be done and the way that Bitcoin um, should be advanced uh, and and this should become the standard. And so we're, we're making it that, that way uh, at OnRamp. So, you know, just a little pitch there for everyone out there who's, who's wondering what's the differences between the ETFs and OnRamp Bitcoin Trust. Thanks for tuning in. If you're interested in exploring any of these topics further or want to learn more about how we can help you secure a new or existing Bitcoin allocation, get in touch with our team at OnRampBitcoin.com. We look forward to supporting you on your Bitcoin journey. We don't have to go farther, but this is organic, uh, you know, something I always respected and Marty and Matt from the pods talking business on air. I think it was always fun to hear. And part of what Jesse just described was this uh, last night in Slack was thinking about the ETFs and all the stuff going on and realizing like just how bad of products and, and what we created and was like, we should really create a narrative for our network, the network on this podcast, the network that listens to the podcast and people just know fundamentally that people will maybe not go by spot to start, but are going to go to the ETF. And how do we like build what Jesse just described, what Marty just described of like into the models of people's brains that are known, they're going to ask about what, where should I get Bitcoin of all the underlying reasons that Jesse just explained why we would explain it um, to them or why they would refer somebody. And so to David and Marty, who advisors and, and close to what we're doing, I'm curious, like, how do you guys feel about that from just like a the messaging standpoint and how we should drive? Because historically, we haven't had a singular like focus on a certain product that we're doing and also like a cohort. And this is also a cohort that we're just not generally like seeing right now, just because I mean, we do see some, but it's not like a, a concerted focus. We see a lot of like on the custody side because people naturally want a better form of custody. But curious to like that, that pitch that Jesse said and how you, how you guys would feel about us getting behind that in a heavy way and if we can like mobilize the people that understand what's happening and that there's a better solution out there well i might say that um you know etfs may be useful and an interesting um sort of tip of the spear moment for folks who haven't yet been exposed to bitcoin and in for instance a donor advised fund or a non-self-directed ira um it can be a way to at least be introduced to to bitcoin however I think we're all well acquainted with the the, uh, the merits, as previously discussed, of uh, doing it in a more pure and um, and um, uh, secure fashion, and um, and so I think that's where on ramp comes in because you know you you are using more than one custodian, and by the way, you can also do what I did, which is to create a self directed IRA, and then you do as you please. You're not sort of locked into whatever Charles Schwab or somebody else wants you to do. Um, and so, I, you know, I think there's room for both, um, but on-ramp is probably the next step in the evolution, um, within at least, you know, my demographic, I'm not sure by the way, how Larry feels about this, but, um, within my peer group, I think it's still, you know, even now a heavier lift It's becoming less of a heavy lift, but, um, but it's not sort of understood, let alone embraced, um, 
within this group. However, you know, given um, this this age bracket, this is kind of where the money is. So, um, and furthermore, a lot of us work for big institutions, so that too can be a point of entry. Um, but that's, I guess, kind of where I stand. No, and I would anchor back to the trust minimized. I mean, right? <laughs> Not go too Marty Jones here, but it's like you mentioned earlier. A lot of the ETF Bitcoin is held with a single custodian. That's a lot of trust, and right now, that's hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin worth of trust in one institution, which just doesn't make sense. And if you're thinking about making an allocation of Bitcoin, and you're thinking of the potential worst case scenarios in the future. I mean, I think that's a pretty low hanging fruit is like you have the centralized entity and there's many ways in which that centralized entity could be attacked. It could or not even attacked could mess up. It could, I don't think it's going to happen, but it's certainly within the realm of possibility, lose access to the private keys that secure all that Bitcoin. Um, it's a big honeypot for governments to point at. And, and that's one institution that a government would have to go to and say, Hey, you need to sign the private key and move the Bitcoin to this address that we control um, and so again, going back to the, the anchor of trust minimization, it's in this model, this multi-institution, multi-sig, uh, it's less trust in a single institution. A trust is distributed amongst many institutions, which increases the bar uh, uh, at which an attacker would need to get at your Bitcoin. So just from a first principle security perspective, um, knowing that you can wake up in a decade and the probability of you being able to access your, access your Bitcoin via a multi-institution, multi-sig setup versus a single institution, single sig setup. Like it's just a no-brainer in my mind, but obviously I've been in this industry for 11 years and understand the nuances to all of this, and I think that's the big hurdle that anybody pushing this multi-sig, multi-institution model needs to overcome is helping people understand that these properties exist in the first place, and they are superior to um, a single sig single custodian setup yeah it's all education i feel like this is a big part of we've kind of mean uh bukele and el salvador taking delivery of their assets right because i think that was like a narrative of like wait you're sitting here you know everybody hates you as far as like the you know un or the imf uh and then you're putting your bitcoin i think it was rumored or, or it was known that it was at coinbase and so this angle of like just natural education around centralization, the ability, it doesn't have to be like anything crazy. It's literally, we hear it all day long. People just get hacked between their phone and Coinbase and they don't insure that. They say they insure it. You, nobody gets paid out because your phone, you press the wrong button. Yeah. And, and on the, um, I, I guess uh, when it comes to Coinbase, uh, I, I feel like this is, many people won't feel this way, but I feel that there's a greater risk uh, than, than most people realize or, or think possible that Coinbase's Bitcoin is at some point seized by the U.S. government. Um, and I say that because if we are dealing with what we, we think we're dealing with here, which is the, the shaping of the new monetary world order um, that will last for a very, very long time, the stakes are incredibly high. And, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier, if, if you believe that the U.S. government, the, the CIA was capable of killing the sitting president uh, with JFK, then what's uh, what's one more cardinal sin here of, you know, just seizing the, the coins held by one company, nationalizing one company uh, and seizing those assets that currently aren't worth a ton right. in the grand scheme of the world, but would secure a government a couple million Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah to I take it a step further, it's completely logical to believe that people, if Coinbase was a solution, that Bitcoin works. Like, you just like, it's their first, it's like the greatest uh, level of cognitive dissonance and the understanding of like what happened to gold, that it can't hold all the assets. Like, and so we talk about, you know, multi-institution, all these things, it's like, just take possession of your keys in any way you can, if you want this thing to be successful. <laughs> it's like literally that I think anybody is worth their salt will say, and then you figure it out from there. But even on a ledger, I would could be more convinced and I'd be scared to wake up and realize that I just can't get access. And that's all they can do. It's like literally just say no because we didn't like that you logged on to Twitter and said one thing. It's, yeah, I'm, I'm, let me make a couple of points. I mean, one, I, I just 
I've, I've watched Coinbase since inception, and um, I know I wouldn't be comfortable having coins stored there based on you know the way they crash all the time and you know, the behavior, etc. And and so I, you know, unfortunately, I have some coins, or not, well, fortunately, unfortunately, just it's a fact. I have some retirement accounts that I can't free up. And so I, I have some coins that I've purchased through retirement accounts. And uh, um, I, I like Fidelity's custody solution much better than Coinbase's. So I'm in FBTC and we recommend all our clients that you select that, you know, over the Black the black uh, Rock product. Um, but I let's go to what Jesse was talking about, because I, I think that's a very interesting question. And I find it interesting. I think Sailor is doing a very nice job of talking about digital property. I mean, he's smart enough to know, we're all smart enough to know that ultimately sats are going to kill the dollar, that the, the dollar is going to hyperinflate and we're going to be on a sat based standard. He knows that. But he also knows that politically, you know, that doesn't serve our interest to say that and to lead with that spear. Um, and he's, he's taking the Jeff Booth piece of let's co opt the other side as much as possible um, and just call this digital property. And yeah, the dollar can coexist, no problem. Yep. So it turns out it's very, very inferior as a form of money, but you know we'll deal with that later. Well, here's the thing: once it gets critical, I mean, and 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 by the way, you know what just happened with the ETFs is an enormously positive thing because the big pools of money obviously could not go into this asset because they weren't going to buy treasures or ledgers or cold cards and self custody, you know, for their boomer clients. They just weren't going to do it. Um, but now it's a ticker symbol, and they can get twenty bips on it, and so they just you know put in the order. And off they go. Although, ironically, I heard yesterday, you know, Morgan Stanley, if you're a Morgan Stanley brokerage account client, you can't buy a Bitcoin ETF. What they're trying to do is push you into their managed Bitcoin product where they will try and dampen the volatility and they want to charge you 100 basis points to be in that. Isn't that amazing? I mean, and, and the same is true, actually, of Edward. No, a similar thing is true at Edward Jones. It's a big brokerage firm and they are Edward Jones is not letting their clients buy these ETFs. I'm just like, I'm stunned by that. But, but you know, bottom line is these ETFs created the ability for um, the average financial advisor to say, yeah, we'll get you some Bitcoin. Um, and, and of course, as we all know, that's a huge deal. Um, and, and, it, and it removed the notion that the government hates this thing and they're gonna shut it down. I mean, among a lot of my normie boomer friends who have money, they were like, yeah, okay, you may be right, but it doesn't matter, the government's gonna shut it down. Well. Suddenly, that argument's not so relevant with these ETFs and ETF approval. And so, I, to be honest with you, I was kind of shocked that they did it. And I, I think you know the three judges that approved, you know, that, that ruled in favor of GBTC. I think those guys are going to go down as heroes because they're the guys who kind of more or less pushed the SEC into taking this position. But, but let me keep going. So we get further down the road, and you know this is existential for them, right? We're, we are playing for all of the fiat and the money marbles, and. Um, you know, we get down the road and the dollar really is kind of failing. And, you know, Bitcoin's at, you know, 600,000, you know, going to a million. And, um, you know, gold's at four or $5,000 an ounce and inflation is raging. And within the U.S. government kind of realize, you know, holy shit, we're losing control of this entire monetary system. And the reason is these alternative assets are, you know, they're, they're, they're exits that we're letting people get on and, 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 the more they get on it, the more aggressive law kicks in. And sooner or later, we're ultimately gonna, all going to lose our jobs, be wiped out, and the currency is going to be worthless. And so in order to protect the union, protect the country, protect the dollar, protect all of us, we got to stop this shit. And it's pretty simple. We're going to tax gold and silver and Bitcoin at 80% a year. And you know maybe we're going to seize these ETFs and just make it illegal. Um, and of course, you know there'll be a huge constituency of us that will cry foul but, um, you know, there'll be a big difference between the people who have their own keys and their, their 12 words and, and the ability to go anywhere in the world and protect their wealth and the people who have their money siloed in their system where, you know, Coinbase can one day wake up and say, yeah, I know Bitcoin's trading at a million dollars, but the last price pre that was 200,000 and we're going to cash settle you out at 200,000. We'll send you 200,000 for each of your coins. We don't care that it's trading at a million tough shit. And, and, and I mean, because the same thing could happen in gold, too. I mean, I, I think the, the natural gold price today, if you compare it to the 1971 standard, would be 80000 an ounce because there are all kinds of paper gold derivatives that have been created to hold the price down. Um, and so when, you know, when, it, when the shit hits the fan for the federal government, and I think it will at some point, um, I think we can expect or, or we have to at least game theory out that they might take actions which are, you know, in our view, completely illegal 
completely wrong. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's my grandfather was enraged by FDR in 6102. Um, and yet, you know, he packed the Supreme Court and they supported him on it. I mean, it's, you know, the, the government, remember that the job of the government is to keep the people in the government in power. It's not to do what's best for the rest of us. It's to protect themselves. And so when this gets to the point of being serious and existential, I think, you know, those people who've moved into this, I mean, I, I try and get my clients to get into Bitcoin, but if they're not ready to buy a treasure, um, you know, the, the second best solution is to be in an ETF is at least they'll get the price appreciation. Then I start working on them about how they've got to get out of there and get into it, get into holding their own you know, coins and self sovereignty. But, but I think this, I think Jesse, you're right. I, I, I believe this is going to become, <coughs> excuse me, a very important issue. Um, <coughs> as what we're talking about here develops. Yeah, it was very well put and kind of like the roadmap, because I think we, we, we often say the, why it's a problem, but breaking down exactly why it's a logical problem uh, is helpful. So I appreciate you going through that, Larry. And it's the dynamics of Bitcoin are very interesting, too, because we're lucky today that most Bitcoin is held in self-custody and keys that people control. And it's really a race against time and price, because if the price of Bitcoin goes up, like thinking about how powerful the government is and um, what it can do to try to force Bitcoiners into a corner. Like they're in a race against time in, in regards to like the price going up. We had a really interesting event here at the Commons last week, Bitcoin Urbanism, led by Tour de Meester, Kelly Landon, and Austin Tunnell. And Tour gave a great presentation. And it's like if you look at the top 1% right now, um, in terms of high net worth individuals, individuals that own more than $50 million worth of wealth in the world bitcoiners make up about uh, i believe one to ten percent of that right now but as the price goes up we take a, a larger share of the high net worth individuals in the world and at some point there's a flipping where um, as we know money talks in this world and if the price of bitcoin gets to a certain point bitcoiners will be extremely wealthy at which point you begin to use that wealth to affect change in the political economy um, whether that, that be making the government smaller um, or just investing in private enterprise to compete with government um, government programs. And I think that's something that the government is highly aware of is whether they admit it or not, is they're looking at the price of Bitcoin and they have to intuitively understand if we get, this gets to a certain point, there's going to be a bunch of freedom loving, extremely wealthy people that are competing with us on the market. And I think that will factor into their decisions no about what they do with these ETFs and, and well, the beauty is they hold custodians. They hold Bitcoin as well, right? Like they have to at a certain point, like Senator Warren or whoever is the you know token person of the, the week or month that hates Bitcoin is probably having to pump their or pack their bags just in case it takes off. Um, Marty, would you said it because I know we have limited time in it. It's a segue or part of like what you just mentioned for Larry is um, quote the Raven. Well, I don't know like how many people listen, and I know Marty, you know of him. I thought it was Philly really guy. Cool. Oh, so that's Philly right. guy. Oh, we yes, oh, yeah. that's very cool because I think like he's an interesting angle for a number of reasons. One, what Marty just tied into of an existing, you know, call it tradfi, you know, person that's looking at the macro trad uh, traditional markets, hated Bitcoin. He came at it from a number of, uh, it, and the reason I'm bringing it up is because I like heard him talk uh, the only reason i listened to his pod larry is because you were on it i think multiple times and i heard how like much he just he hated bitcoin and how crazy he how crazy he was it was actually an opposite signal for me where i was like man if this guy doesn't get it how can i listen to anything else that he talks about but yeah. then to see that like 180 shift and then i had a guy reference that i should listen to the pod that he did with peter uh, mccormick and he talks about you know just how he couldn't get in the have fun staying poor kept him out for so long but then he finally sees it and how the, the mobilization of the GameStop and all this stuff and people's like mental and, and emotional capital and physical and human capital has been targeted the wrong way. Anyway, I thought it was a compelling version of what Marty just described of like at a certain point, the just narrative is shifting slower and slower from people that were didn't believe this to get there. And were and he seems like just this, this interesting point in that because he was so against it. Well, if I could interject here too, I think Chris says an name publicly. Yeah, yeah. Chris yeah. Irons is his name, yeah. but David, he's from Fishtown, Philadelphia, and he, you said he's TradFi, Michael, but he's really trying to bring like a blue collar perspective to yeah. TradFi. Like if you understand where he's from in Philly, like Fishtown, that part of 
the Philadelphia area is very blue collar. A lot of union workers, and he's trying to like put forward a voice for this blue collar demographic. And David, like, it, it, like th- being from Philadelphia and coming from a family of union men myself, like these are the types of people that should be getting into Bitcoin because they feel beaten down by the system. Um, having supported it, particularly union workers have voted for a lot of Democrats historically um, who have inevitably made their life worse with their fiscal and monetary policies. Um, but that's what Chris said on what Bitcoin did is really encouraging in terms of really lighting a fire under the blue collar class who may participate in Occupy Wall Street, but really didn't understand the solutions, the problems in the first place, let alone the solutions that would solve these problems. That is a really good signal that Chris is on this and pitching this message to the union workers of, of Fishdown, Philadelphia, who are looking for a solution to these problems. He's a smart guy, and I've been on his show a few times because he's a gold guy. And, and uh, I always kind of thought to myself, you know, this guy's going to get it eventually. I just got to keep mm-hmm. working on it. You know? And uh, um, he's just too smart not to. And he's open-minded. He, and he... You know, to his own credit, I mean, he, he says, you know, I'm just an idiot, you know, trying to make it in the investment world. I mean, I think, you know, to me, the, the humility is always the issue that, that stops people from getting it. I mean, you've got to have a certain amount of humility to, you know, to accept it and to understand it. And the people who don't accept it and understand it tend to be, you know, kind of arrogant people. You know, I, I think of Rickards or I think of... Um, I don't know. Well, uh, it's Jeff. been, uh, you know, his piece on his conversion to Bitcoin, I thought was really interesting. And we Bitcoiners, and it's been said before, need to be careful about sort of doing victory laps and stopping on people's faces when they finally come around <laughs> and instead yeah. kind of like welcome them with, with open Absolutely. arms instead, because, you know, it, it, uh, it's a, it's an act of humility to come around and say, Hey, look, Sailor and right. thought, it was, thought it was bullshit. And, you know, we've all, We've all, and I, I know my, my conviction on it has grown over time. I mean, I, you know, I started with some conviction and, and now I'm, you know, I've got raging conviction, <laughs> but, but I, you know, it took, it took time to go down that path um, because, you know, there are risks and you want to understand them fully and you want to see things, you know, develop in the fashion that you would expect. Um, Jesse, you'd love this. Like on the pod, he explains, you know, the have fun same poor kept him out. And then he's like, once I got in, they're like, fuck you, you, you idiot. You're only in 10%. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you can't win. You can't right. win until you're a hundred percent all in. You're a hundred percent in. Yeah. And that hundred percent, you know, you gotta remember a hundred percent is not the appropriate allocation for some right. people. I mean, it's in your twenties and thirties, that's fine. I mean, right. you know, if you're if you're not if you're investment got, advice if you've got meaningful wealth you're a boomer and you're 60 70 80 i mean it's i mean you know it's rough to be 100 percent. i mean the, the thing does have drawdowns right yeah yeah and i mean this harkens back to the beginning of the conversation we're talking about the gap in that exists in the pensions right now like i don't think anybody expects these pensions to ape in and put 100 percent of their allocation in the bitcoin would be insane but i think on this tip, like it is important for Bitcoiners to um, have some humility ourselves and say, all right, we have to recognize that not everybody's going to ape in. Right. Like we have, um, and thinking of the pension specifically, like I think it is, again, going back to moral imperatives, it is a moral imperative that we try to give the people who believe they're going to have some funds in retirement to be able to enjoy their lives on the back end of it to actually do that. And I think it's a moral imperative to convince these pensions, like, yeah, you don't have to buy a 15, 20, 50% Bitcoin allocation, but you should seriously consider getting some allocation to make sure that you can provide your pensioners with a retirement fund at the end of the day. And it's just, it's, it's meeting people where they're at. I've always deeply respected Marty from like, we were forged when you think about being in around and Marty even before in the fire of like all the craziness that happened. And so I think we generally have like tough skin when we want to go and meet people and hit them over the head. But the reality is like, people just don't respond to that. And (laughs) if we want to bring in the people with capital, we have to, and part of this pod and a lot of the things we work on aren't necessarily built in the just hardcore ethos of somebody, if you went on, you know, Bitcoin, Twitter, but the reality is all the money sits outside of the system. And so we have to bring it into this system. We have to start with like, how do we meet them there? And the ETF is the greatest example, because we said everything about Coinbase, but at the same time, we need the ETF to get to the other side, even though it's the thing that'll lead itself. Absolutely. Yeah. No, the ETF is not the endpoint solution, but it's an enormously positive thing um, because, you know, people put money into it, they'll see it go up and they start to wonder why. I mean, it's like everybody's journey, I think, starts with a modest allocation and 
as you learn more and get greater conviction, you know, your, your weighting goes up. I mean, well, the other thing that happens is your weighting goes up naturally because it appreciates so damn much. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm well over 50, you know, 60% now. And part of that is maybe approaching 70. And part of that's because the gold shit I hold hasn't really moved much and the Bitcoin, you know, has gone up 150% this year. So, I mean, you know, eventually without even selling any gold, I mean, Bitcoin could eventually become 90% of my assets because it's just gone up so damn much. What a terrible problem to have. Yeah, right. It would really <laughs> suck. Yeah. Well, it, it is kind of annoying because I'd like the gold to at least keep, you know, some pace with it. I mean, it, it, gold appears to have broken out here. And I, I think the whole notion that gold is, is not going to perform in nominal terms is wrong. I, I don't, Bitcoin is stealing share from gold. There's no doubt. And it's a much better vehicle and it's a faster racehorse. But I think that, you know, in a fiat world, I mean, we were talking about this in another call I did it yesterday where, you know, do they compete with one another? And the answer is, of course, they do. But but really, you're still talking. I mean, at Bitcoin at 1.3 trillion, gold at 12 trillion, um, you know, and fiat assets, financial assets at 350 trillion. I mean, that's the elephant, right? I mean, you know, the elephant is the 350, and where the hell is that going to go? You know, not whether a little bit more of it goes to gold or a little bit more of it goes to Bitcoin. I mean, these are still, you know, a pimple on the ass of the elephant, and and that's why you know they both have so much optionality and upside and. You know, I, I fully expect Bitcoin to be a million dollars, you know, a coin. And, you know, I probably expect gold to be, you know, 5,000 an ounce or maybe 10. I mean, which is, you know, nice performance from here, but nothing close to what Bitcoin has done. And I know so at the entry point, I, I've been suggesting to people, you know, like, why not just uh, especially um, like smaller endowments and so forth, but also just friends. Why not start with a low double, a, a low single digit amount? Absolutely. It's US, right. Yeah, that's what I always say. I mean, the only wrong allocation is zero. And I say, look, you can't afford to, you know, you've got investment assets. You can't afford to lose 2% of your assets. Come on. You know, yeah, let's, yeah. Let's assume it's going to zero. You know, you can put 2% into it and then just give me some time and let's let's see what happens. And because, you know, you're going to, I mean, investing is about, you know, not experiencing regret. And if I tell you about it, explain it to you, and you kind of intellectually get it, um, you know, if it goes up 200, 100x, and you knew about it, you're gonna, I mean, if you didn't know about it, that's one thing, but if you knew about it and decided not to do it, and it goes up 100X, you're gonna experience regret, I can assure exactly. you. Exactly. David, I, I know we have to wrap in a few minutes, but I'm curious if, uh, and you can take time either one, is on the, the gold side and getting gold people involved, because I know that's been a discussion, but the other side is the plug. Uh, I think you're gonna be at the Bitcoin okay. John with Lynn, and and if you wanna share that, because this Philly, Philly thing keeps growing stronger. I didn't even know Quoth was from there. We got to have him come and, and uh, we'll reach out to him to join. But um, if you want to talk about that before we wrap up, and Marty, sorry. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's April 1st, right, Marty, in, in Philadelphia. And um, and what's funny about Philadelphia is uh, we have like this locus of hardcore Bitcoiners there. And uh, and so, yeah, Lynn Alden will be speaking. And uh, for those who aren't acquainted with the term John, it means like thing in <laughs> Philadelphia. Multifaceted. So, uh, so, yeah, Marty's a native as am I. So uh, it should be a great gathering. And um, and uh, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn and mentioning that um, um, Thomas at PubKey and some other folks are hoping to maybe establish an outpost uh, in Philadelphia. So. Right. In any event, uh, look for that as a, as a new uh, competitor to the likes of Nashville and Austin and some other uh, Bitcoin uh, <laughs> epicenters. Jackson from the team, I think, is going to meme, meme it in existence. He's, he wants uh, he needs an outpost in PA. So no, it's uh, it's happening. Philly. Again, we've talked about this many times in the show. It gets a lot of flack, but that spirit yeah. of freedom still lives on in many of the citizens of Philadelphia. That's and honestly like I, where I'm from originally from philadelphia but moved to delaware county a suburb like a lot of the blue collar workers there get it and are allocating to bitcoin a lot of i'd say it's 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 easier to orange pill blue collar people than it is some of these fiat you know trade trade guys i mean they're just they think they're they think they're smarter than they are i mean the the average blue collar guy gets it you know, if you ever go talk to the atm owners like the largest ones the bitcoin atms they'll tell you exactly that like from just yeah. a first, from, like they see the videos because they explain how these things are just biometric machines right because you're always yeah. making sure you're not getting games so they see the people coming up truck drivers all the things with dollars to convert into bitcoin it's a whole world that we don't even like know about that's well, and, and this, this actually goes back historically too i've got a lot of you know just kind of blue collar workers who've 
done work at one of my houses as an example, you know, painters and plumbers and that kind of stuff. And it's amazing before Bitcoin exists. It's amazing. I, I talked to him all because I was a sound money guy. And I'd say, how do you, you know, how do you save your money? Oh, I buy silver coins. You know, I, I, I you know, I, I, I know the government's screwing up the money. I just, I buy silver, I buy gold. I'm kind of like, wow, you know, I mean, this, this guy's a plumber, but he gets it. You know what I mean? <laughs> he totally gets it. And, uh, well, and it makes sense because he's not completely disconnected from the world. Right. He sees real work. Yeah, he actually right. does yeah. real honest work, and he he understands that the government prints money and dilutes the value of his work. And so he's like, yeah, they can't they can't print silver. I'm I'm buying that. Yeah, I can get it. The blue collar guys uh, have a distrust of government and and the system in general, and the the white collars have the trust in the system. The, yes, that's the, your model. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the yep. We have a lot high yep, trust. Elite. Well, pull up, pull up the chart from earlier, Logan. We can end on this. This is why they have a lot of trust in that system because they're incentivized <laughs> yeah, to. There you go. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's, it's been very good to them. Yeah, it's been very good to them. It has. Yeah. So this is. So yeah, the chart. their net worth exactly tracks the 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 uh, <laughs> the M two uh, supply. It's just absolutely amazing chart. Yeah, and it's yeah, really sad. Gonna... That's like inverted productivity. <laughs> Like it's the opposite yeah. of how we'll you, you guys should keep going without me. I've, I've made another commitment to another guy to do a call at 11. So I've, I got to hop off. It's really been great. Uh, David, good to see you. everybody else. We all know each other. Great, great to be a part of this and uh, happy to do it anytime. But I got to hop. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Larry. Thanks, Larry. Ooh. Should we talk? Larry, so, by the now? way, no, I'm kidding. What's that morning? <laughs> So should we talk shit on Larry now? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's speaking of uh, that last topic, and and you're having mentioned uh, Andrew, who's running for con Congress down in Florida, Andrew Gubin. Um, you know, there there is a more benign path forward, rather than sort of accelerating the uh, the decline of of our uh, the good old USA, which is, you know, if we can get people into office who understand money um and it could happen we already have a few you know we could see a flippening of uh of sort of the political attitudes toward bitcoin um so it's not necessarily the case that we'll have this sort of government protects its own kind of uh outcome it feels like trump's kind of there right like just some of the yeah, narrative yeah, like that, one, yeah. some of the things he's been saying or four years ago remember it was such a big deal when he tweeted about it and he was like i don't like any of this stuff or whatever and then the past couple of quotes they've gotten from he's like oh yeah it's a currency people use it i'm cool it's cool it's cool yeah yeah and we've been talking about this for a while of like i think like senator lummis sort of proved that if you like if you harness the power of this community, people who care about Bitcoin um, or digital assets more broadly, like that can be a powerful ally for you and, and, and help you get into office and stay in office through fundraising and, 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 and votes. Um, and then, so, you know, that kind of established this precedent. And then we saw RFK, make his big splash at, at uh, Bitcoin 2023 in Miami coming out like with great, sh very sharp talking points uh, in favor of Bitcoin written by some Bitcoin handler uh, behind the scenes. But, you know, that, that made a big splash. And then uh, Vivek also sort of aligned himself with Bitcoin and Bitcoin interests. Um, and in, in that way, all elected elected representatives or candidates see how the Bitcoin voting block and donors can help them. And so, you know, politicians are fundamentally interested in that and mm -hmm. they will adopt what helps them and they will stand behind that because it matters to the people that are funding them and voting for them. Um, and so that's how, you know, even Trump is having to recognize that the winds are shifting and maybe it's in his interest to soften his stance and then potentially even embrace um, crypto. You know, he won't get Bitcoin. Uh, he'll, he'll just adopt, you know, yeah, I'm friendly on crypto if it suits him. Um, but, you know, pretty soon that'll be just a, a boilerplate standard for any serious uh, political candidate that if they want to get uh, the votes of the, the millennials uh, in particular and, and 
you know, also uh, across the demographic spectrum, but I think probably disproportionately with the millennials, they should talk this up um, and, and stand behind it. And so, you know, I think David's right that like, it's not that it's the incumbent Washington positions versus the um, disruptive Bitcoin positions. It's it's that politicians will adopt whatever is winning and whatever helps them win. And we eat, you know, we eat DC from the inside in that way. Well, and if you think about it too, if a politician were actually really smart and wanted to leave a mark, they would embrace it wholeheartedly because it's like the path of least resistance of fi fixing the systemic problems that lie before them. Like if you look at the national debt, you look at the, the monetary situation, you look at what's going on in the energy sector, like Bitcoin fixes a lot of these problems naturally if you just let it proliferate. So if you if I were a politician thinking smartly about this and I wanted the path of least resistance to, to fix all these problems, I would open up the floodgates and we have examples of that. Look what's happened in El Salvador over the last couple of years. Look what's happened in other parts of the world where Bitcoin has been embraced. And so I think that's what would be really encouraging to see as a politician recognizes that it's like, oh, I've got a lot of massive problems to fix and I'm just going to pick the path of least resistance, which is embracing Bitcoin. Which makes sense. Like that, that's how it would play out simply because if we believe Bitcoin is the most beautiful alignment of incentives and how it works, it would make, it would follow that it would have a transition and it's not popular to talk about because it doesn't, it feels too nice. It sounds like too great to be true, but like where this actually does play out with Jesse describe what we're talking about here actually does work out, which would be, be very bullish for kind of like humanity and like where we're heading over the next couple decades. Well, Marty and I have talked about this a little bit, but I think too, as uh, Bitcoin goes up in value and, and, uh, and Bitcoiners um, enjoy uh, higher net worths, that we ought to, in anticipation of that moment, think about, you know, how we might support, in this case, political candidates who kind of get it. And then um, and then also freedom friendly organizations. Marty is aware of them involved in something called the Global Liberty Institute. But there are plenty of others, too, that well, Students for Liberty is one Human Rights Foundation, obviously, that are doing great work, uh, whether or not they're directly involved in Bitcoin, as Students for Liberty and Human Rights Foundation are. Um, we can use our wealth to support organizations that are pointing humanity in the right direction. Yeah. It's an interesting Trojan horse that's come up a few times. It's something we have to work on of like helping even, you know, large organizations just take the donations from wealthy individuals that have become wealthy in Bitcoin from a taxable perspective as the way you start that process. Right. Because they, they naturally see its appreciation. So I think no. there's a lot there where capital starts to form and move and aligning those incentives. And to your point, if the right people have the right money, then you can actually affect the right change. Yep. It is the path of least resistance. That's a dream of the day. The political, <laughs> class, political class wakes up. They look at everybody pissed off about the immigration situation, the energy situation, the private property rights situation. And they're like, oh, God, this is an all-consuming, all-encompassing problem that we have no way, we're not going to fix it the traditional route of printing more debt and issuing more dollars. Like, let's pick the path of least resistance. Let's just embrace Bitcoin. And this then is, let the free market take care of it. And this is why I'm really g genuinely excited about the Philly PA stuff because you can see like the inkling of it. We saw this in Texas. You just need the seed and then it starts to grow and grow and the meetup grows larger. And then you have advocacy groups and people start there. And then obviously you guys are friends. And so like you guys are tied, that's your home. Like you want it to be successful. And so it's just like literally starting there. And so I think it's going to be one of the biggest or definitely would probably be the biggest for this month. But ideally it grows on that and somebody else wants to go. Somebody else comes in, a politician shows up, and this is literally how it happens. It has to start with like that individual. I think Keita is a, a big part of that. Matt, good friend, who started um, the John meetup and took that stance of like, hey, I'm going to put a, you know, show up to a pub, show up under a tree. That's how the Houston meetup started. We literally showed up under a, an oak tree, and then people start to come. And I think like per capita, the Houston meetup probably still is the, the biggest meetup in the country just because there's 7 million people in Houston. But I think this is a broader point, like in any city or market, like you just have to like put a flag out, throw it out there and people will start. They're everywhere. I was in Palm Beach meeting folks, won't mention who. And, and it's funny because there's a lot of high net worth 
trad fine individuals that made a lot of money in, in Wall Street and they all live like literally I, I joke and feel like they're like can throw a rock and hit each other's houses, but they don't talk to each other simply because the old world ostracized or would like put them as, you know, not basically talk to them if they ever brought up Bitcoin. So there's just this version in the meat space world of like somebody has to take a, a chance or put it out there that they're available to meet or build that community. And then it just starts to snowball from there. Well, that was actually a beautiful thing. Justin Moon from Fed, he gave a presentation. He's known here in Austin as the godfather of uh, the BitDevs meetup. He moved down here, I believe in 2019. And like you said, Michael didn't meet under a tree, but met at the library here in Austin. There was three people at the first meetup. Then there were seven people. Then there was 12 people. Then Unchained stepped up and said, come to our offices. And that eventually led to the commons. And he was explaining how like just planting that seed and building this community really helped him start come to the idea to start Fetty and then in this office in the commons and the, the community that he built in Austin, eventually he and the mutiny guys did the first ever uh, lightning transaction between two different Fetty mints, um, which I think will be looked back as like a profound innovation in Bitcoin. And so the point being is like you start small, three people in a library, 10 people under a tree and five years after Justin did that, he's got a whole company. He's got a whole, We've got a whole community here in Austin building different companies and pushing Bitcoin forward. And it literally started with four people at the, the Austin library. <laughs> well, the other constructive thing about these sort of um, organic communities is that, you know, as um, maybe this is too strong a word, I'm not sure, but nonetheless, as rage builds because people sort of sense that something's wrong. Um, you know, just tearing down statues and, and setting fire to buildings is not going to be the solution. And so if we can build these communities and, and explain to them why a lot of these social phenomena have happened and that at its root, it's, it's about sort of the flawed money. Um, we can direct our energies in productive fashion instead of sort of this, um, this um, unbridled and misdirected um, anger that we've seen over the course of the last several years. And it's positive sum. This is the creative right. part. Like this whole world, generally, everybody's taken from somebody else at the benefit. Like the more we all figure out how to get everybody else involved in doing everything we're talking about, we all win. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. Um, are we going to win, Marty? We're winning. We are going to win. Um, no, and it's positive. You see it within the industry, too. I mean, we don't have to go too much deeper into this conversation because I know we all have time, but I think that's the beauty of this open, permissionless network as we see it at 1031 with the portfolio companies, like you can be building a company in a particular vertical um, and highly focused on that, but you can benefit from what other people are doing. I mean, mempool.space is embedded in uh, most companies within the portfolio are using them for uh, block explorer um, or backend enterprise solutions. You think about what you guys are doing at OnRamp and all these other multi-sig, they benefit from the hardware wallets and the PSBT standards that are set. Um, you, Talking about integrations with the Lightning Network, you don't have to go build that yourself. You can leverage the hard work that other companies have done um, in the mining space. Um, companies like Upstream Data are um, are benefiting prop miners who don't want to build the infrastructure. So there's this like big uh, positive sum symbiotic relationship just between the companies building the space as well. It's a it's a great point why like altcoins are always in my mind like part of the reason why. You you shouldn't have a value prop is like the interoperability is what you're describing from like open networks where we know how the internet works. It's very similar, like from a custodial perspective, right? You shouldn't take, it's pretty simple. Don't take centralized as, or decentralized asset park it with central custodian, but the natural ability for multi-sig to be interoperable lets you build on these different webs of trust. And I like to think of them as like daisy chaining, um, like the integrity of the custodial solution, because if one goes out or is under historically, you're basically have zero. You, you know, you have a goose egg, FTX, block five Celsius, we can go forever. But the idea is you take that trust out of there. And so that's why, like, I think just from like a pure, just first principle, like you can't even custody any like crypto asset in this way, because every custodian has its own uh, proprietary implementation of multi-party computation. So you literally have to trust one entity or you're going to take delivery. And just from a like network perspective, it's always flawed just at that base level um and so this interoperability just on the custody level and if play directly into this as well when it comes to multi-sig and who's holding those keys 
and the interoperability between the eCash tokens and Lightning are very similar. It's just a more resilient, robust network. If you care nothing about money, but just look at it from a network perspective, like one is naturally flawed because of that. And the other one has like the open ability to continue to grow. And guys, so uh, while I have a moment, speaking of private companies, uh, I know that at least one of us on this call is co-founder of a VC fund, and uh, and I work for a firm that uh, that is involved in private equity. And so, and by the way, as an LP in a few VC funds, an advisor to one, um, and uh, and uh, an investor in a whole bunch of private equity vehicles, my stance on PE is probably not quite as uh, harsh as maybe Larry's <laughs> is. I mean, I think we can all comfortably say that the people on this call are invested in and involved in funds that uh, you know mark their their underlying portfolio companies. Uh, uh, in ways that uh, reflect their honesty and their honest as the day is long. But, um, but you know, the incentives are there uh, to acknowledge the earlier point to do otherwise. But I think it's really dependent upon the firm. And thankfully, uh, the firms with which we're involved uh, do it correctly. That was a very nice disclaimer, David. I appreciate it. And that was uh, both... <laughs> <laughs> I want to clear that up uh, for everyone. Yeah, I mean, I think for, for, it was joking. I think like the, the reality is it's just like everything we're talking in generalizations. There's a lot of people doing a lot of things the right way from across the board. It's just from an overarching level. There's incentives that are misaligned that we're yep. recognizing. So exactly. yeah, and, you, and Bitcoin in the venture space within Bitcoin, like I think outside of 1031, even like with all these companies, like the ethos and the uh, permissionless nature of Bitcoin really is imbued in these companies as well. Not only that, like the recognition that we're moving to this Bitcoin standard. And so when you're allocating money um, from a venture perspective, like you want to give it to companies who aren't just going to, you don't give companies money for growth at all costs. It's like, no, we live in a Bitcoin standard. Now you run with the assumption that you live in a Bitcoin standard. It's you need to get revenue, get profitable, run as lean as possible and provide extreme utility to your end users. And I think that flipping of the, um, approach to venture capital with the Bitcoin standard standard lens is going to have profound effects on company formation and fundamental value for consumers at the end of the day. Yeah. You throw in AI too, it makes it a lot easier. It's um, <laughs> not a lot easier, but it adds a whole nother dynamic to it. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys uh, this summer. Uh, Marty and I have chatted for multiple years about, cause I have to go, you know, I don't have to, uh, my, my in-laws are in the Northeast. So I go there, <laughs> I go out there in the summers and have it made. And I didn't realize it's just a thing, uh, in PA, like, I guess everybody has a, a shore house. So I know Jackson's down there. I think Eric from Bitcoin talent co you guys, uh, Kita. And so I think there's even some rumblings of a, maybe a John ending up at the beach, um, <laughs> over the summer. So I don't know if I'm talking out of turn now, but you know, I, I don't think Matt would mind. So I don't know, David, forward. I don't think, I don't think this Texas boy can handle the Jersey shore. Uh, <laughs> I, I probably can't, but you know, it's going to be a bit of a culture shock for you. Marty sent me photos. I think if, if the photos of, you know, it seems very uh, familial and, and it seems like a good time. And um, I'm, you know, the, the idea is if we can get like a little group there and we can start to like incept the, 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 minor virus that is Bitcoin. Um, I think the angle that Matt's coming at is very smart too, of more of like personal finance versus like macro or like trad fights. Like how do you just think about your own personal wealth and how can this, I think is a very nice, you know, nice summer, summer white wine and a conversation about protecting your wealth is a, is a nice way to spend. Do they drink white wine in uh, uh, Ocean City and South Jersey <laughs> generally, Marty? I'm not sure. Uh, it's spiked, spiked iced tea is here. <laughs> Again, uh... Actually, Marty's wearing a uh, service supplies cap right now, so he's representing uh, the ah. local. Ocean City. Yeah, great surf shop. It's a great small business example of a great small business that we need to protect. Yeah, that's right. But I like that idea, Michael. So uh, let's see if we can bring that to fruition. Yeah, maybe PubKey will be there. I'll just you're just gonna you're gonna look. Bitcoin's already like in, in getting into PA. It's uh, and all over. I was sort of misty in South Florida. That is ripe for the plucking. That whole area is just, uh, I mean, everybody down there ought to be a Bitcoiner. Yep. It's crazy. It reminds me of California. When we'd go out there from like North LA, 
or Jesse would know better, but like when I went out there from a client perspective, it was like from Northern LA all the way down to like San Diego, it was just prime like Bitcoin people that didn't talk to each other, knew each other. And I remember going down this past month and it was like Miami all the way up to like West Palm. It was people all like, they're like reaching out and I met them, but they didn't know each other at all. Like nobody talks to each other cause they don't know. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. It, it's a, it's a world defined by, um, how do you protect your property and, and, and your wealth and, and Bitcoin answers that. And so it, it, it is prime, uh, right for the picking. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think you, I think you're too humble to do this yourself, David, but I think what you're doing to really get people who are liberty focused and freedom minded that should get Bitcoin, but have not um, have not stepped over the ledge yet to really get them to notice like, Hey, everything you're saying, uh, would be a lot easier to, to, um, it would be a lot easier to affect change in the way in which you want to see change affected. If you added Bitcoin to, to your strategy. And I think that's going to be extremely high leverage and powerful moving forward is really getting these liberty minded movements to understand that if you actually want to bring liberty liberty to the world in the digital age you need a bitcoin strategy yeah well thanks for saying so the uh there are a few opportunities in life maybe only one when you can actually affect positive social change and also perhaps make a lot of money so this is it <laughs> so i climb aboard Check it out. <laughs> it's a great way to finish it off it's so true yeah, yeah. gentlemen this was a fun a fun rip Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us, David. Larry, you're not here, but thank you. If you listen to this in posterity, I'm going to give an official thanks. I was joking earlier. So I should talk shit on you. Um, yeah. Can't wait to do it again. And Same. Uh, we're going to win. We're going to win. We're winning. Thanks, thanks a lot, David. guys. Thank you, David. See ya.